Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum. We range from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark, and I'm joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, and Damon Linker, who writes the Substack newsletter Eyes on the Right. And Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center will be joining us just a few minutes later today. Our special guest this week is Bill Crystal, editor-at-large of The Bulwark. So welcome, one and all. Bill, thanks for joining us. I was very interested in a piece you had this week, Bill, in American Purpose, which was sort of a warning call about how we are handling the matter of Ukraine. And you asked whether we are losing our nerve. And along those lines, let me just set this up by pointing out that a few days ago, a group of 11 House Republicans led by Representative Matt Gates, unveiled what they called a, quote, Ukraine fatigue, unquote, resolution, which stated that the U.S. must end its military and financial aid to Ukraine and urge the combatants to reach a peace agreement. Now, he doesn't speak for the majority of the party, but there's a big strain of Ukraine fatigue among Republicans and even among some Democrats. Well, there's some strain, and the question is how big it gets, and some of that is in our control or in the control of others who sort of give it a lot of oxygen or don't, you know, and, and argue back. But first of all, it's good to be with all of you. And uh, so Jeff Gedman, my friend and friend, I think, of most of us on this podcast, who runs American Purpose, who ran Aston Berlin years ago, who knows Germany very well, we got a little money to do a few roundtables in Berlin to try to talk to them about U.S.-German relations, but particularly with a view towards Ukraine and the idea that, you know, if U.S. and Germany are in the same place, we're in pretty good shape, probably. God knows the Nordic states and the Balts are more hawkish and Poland more determined to help Ukraine. So U.S. and Germany seem key. They each look at each other. The Germans clearly were using, in a sense, what they took to be a little reticence on the part of the Biden administration to go a little slow on their decision about the tanks. And there's a little bit of Biden administration saying, well, we can't go too fast because the Europeans would get worried. I mean, on the whole, I want to say, I think the Biden administration has done well. I think the U.S. has done well. I think Germany has done pretty well. Totally freed themselves from Russian gas in one year. Really amazing. Remember all the conversations we all had a year ago? It's been very hard for them. They got a little lucky because of the weather this winter and because of some other things. But still, the dependency has been built in for so many years and decades. Mm -hmm. And they have really, behind the scenes and to some degree in front of the scenes, but a lot of this has been sort of quiet, the degree of construction and things they have done to reorient their energy sector uh, is really impressive. And that's happened elsewhere in Europe, too. And we've actually, I'm told by people there, done more behind the scenes than Biden sometimes gets credit for in terms of helping with that. So on the whole, I've sort of been a pretty good defender of President Biden and generally of the response to Ukraine. I think it's been better than I would have expected. But I am worried. <laughs> it's always good to worry. And so Jeff and I wrote this little piece. We published it in Germany so the Germans would read it. And there's a little bit too much talk among friends of Ukraine about, gee, six or nine months from now, what if it bogs down? And not enough of a sense of, you know what, this is really a very important next two, three, four, five months. It may not bog down if we really go pretty much all out to help Ukraine. Let's do that. Maybe six months from now we have to rethink things, or Ukraine will have to rethink things. It's not like they'll do rethinking too, but it's premature now to be sort of bargaining with ourselves. Bill Galston, I, as you know, you know, have been pretty um, complimentary toward the Biden administration's leadership on this. But they did something this week that was a little disturbing. They had a high administration official talk to the Washington Post and say to the Post that they are conveying to Ukraine that, quote, we will continue to try to impress upon them that we can't do anything and everything forever, unquote. And this got a really sharp rebuke on Twitter from Elliot Cohn, who has been a guest on this podcast and who was very harsh and said, look, this is the worst possible message to be sending, you know, especially since we have been slow in getting them the arms that they've been asking for. What do you think? Well, I certainly agree with Elliot's critique. And interestingly, I hear that the Biden administration agrees with them too. And that the senior administration official who talked to the Post 
may to some extent have been freelancing or exceeded his brief. So I'm not convinced that that article represents the center of gravity of the administration's thinking on Ukraine. I certainly hope it doesn't. I agree that the Biden administration is not moving at the speed of war Mm. to provide Ukraine with the weapons that it needs. We could do better, and perhaps the looming Russian offensive will light a fire under them. But frankly, I am much less worried about the Biden administration than I am about the Republican opposition to the continuation of the policy in Ukraine. As it happens, a new survey from Quinnipiac University just came out, and it showed that 47% of the Republican rank and file believes that we're doing too much to help Ukraine. That is not the view of independents. It's certainly not the view of Democrats. I think the Biden administration will stay the course and up its game. Whether Republicans in Congress will allow them to is another matter altogether. Damon Linker, I'm worried about both things. <laughs> I'm worried that the Biden administration's dragging its feet on sending fighter aircraft, ATACMS, which is a funny acronym for long-range missiles that they have asked for and that would be very helpful. But there was an earlier poll that also showed this tremendous leeching of support among Republicans. Whereas, for example, in May, 60% favored sending arms to Ukraine. Now the number a week ago was 48%. In March, 55% said it was a bigger priority to sanction Russia effectively, even if it meant damage to the U.S. economy. Now, 59% say limiting damage to the U.S. economy is more important than effectively sanctioning Russia, even if that means sanctions are less effective. Yeah. I mean, first on the Republicans, I think this is an important moment. I mean, not only because of future votes for funding with uh, the Republicans controlling the House, but for what it spells for the longer term future of the Republicans, where I think we have DeSantis's position on foreign policy completely undefined. And I really do think that if he's not the front runner, he's probably the guy best positioned to be the nominee if it's not Trump. We know where Trump stands on all of this. He says he'd end the war in 24 hours, which means he'd basically pull support for Ukraine and let Putin clean up as quickly as possible. But DeSantis hasn't taken really any position on any of these issues. In that respect, it means that that path forward for the Republican Party is wide open, and he and his people are going to be deciding what to do and which way to move based on what unfolds in this period in the party. And so... That's a good pivot to my second point, which is I've been a big booster of Biden on Ukraine on this podcast, including in several uh, exchanges over recent weeks where we've talked about why are they going slow, why dragging feet? And I've tried to muster up an argument for why it's made sense to be resolute and as Bill Crystal put it, uh, you know, keep up our nerve, but also do it at a kind of certain deliberative pace in order to not overly give Putin more of an excuse to say that we're actually directly engaged in the conflict and get a green light from China to hit us back or something like this. But what I truly do not understand on either the policy level of our support for Ukraine and attempt to see them win or on the politics of it is why Biden is not saying anything about this. He said barely a word about Ukraine and the State of the Union. And since then, given that things are ramping up again in the theater, I don't understand why he isn't making the case to the American people, who, as you pointed out, Mona, were quite strongly in favor of this a year ago. And predictably, that is waning, but it's waning in a vacuum. We need the president to actually speak to the American people and explain 
why this is important and why the path that Biden has chosen, this kind of middle path between going to war with Russia on Ukraine's behalf, as we would if they were in NATO, and basically standing back and letting Putin get his way, why that has been intelligent, smart, it's been working, and it will succeed if we remain resolute. And he just won't do it. And that I frankly am baffled by and beginning to get a little demoralized about. Yeah. I'm going to come back to you on this, Bill Crystal, because it really is striking that President Biden has failed to make the case to the American people about the importance of this moment as a historical moment, the importance of it as a turning point in terms of the defense of democratic values, liberal democratic values that he claims to speak for and that he sort of ran for president saying he was going to uphold, he has failed to link our standing up for Ukraine with our larger devotion to those values. And I do think that's a problem. So that's the first part of the question. Second part of the question is, do you think Biden is capable of making that kind of a speech? I think he could, but I asked someone in the administration why the relative silence on Ukraine. And this person made a decent point, which is, I mean, everything is so polarized that if it becomes a big Biden thing, it makes it a little harder for those Republicans who themselves may not be speaking out in a great way, but are voting for aid and are not going along a Matt Gates type path or Donald Trump type path. He doesn't want to make it harder for them. They think it's been okay. There's no need to rock the boat here in terms of making the case dramatically and then provoking a big debate, which gives the anti-Ukraine forces more oxygen. Having said that, I think you also do pay a price, as Damon said, for not articulating the case. I'm not sure that people here fully understand kind of what's at stake. Maybe others can do that some. I mean, one reason Jeff and I wrote that little piece, and just to put this in context for people, the Munich Security Conference is this weekend. It's not a huge deal for most people here. It's a a rather boring, I've been there a few times, a tedious conference actually where everyone makes speeches normally If you go, you go in order to sort of have nice conversations with people in the halls and go out to the you know beer halls of Munich and go to the excellent museum there and so forth and don't pay much attention. But this year, it'll be pretty interesting. I mean, most of the foreign ministers of Europe and defense ministers get together there. Vice President Harris is going for the U.S. along with Secretary Blinken. And I think one reason, frankly, Jeff and I sort of wanted to get out a little bit was try to marginally, slightly increase the odds of a sort of forceful speech by the vice president and forceful uh, speeches by the Germans in particular, and you know, hopefully showing real solidarity. Because whatever happens, six and I must know, there's no downside to showing total solidarity right now. I do think in the State of the Union, I'm told, I think Bill Galston knows maybe a little more about this than I do. I've heard from two different people that there's an earlier draft of the State of the Union that had a fair amount of foreign policy, a fair amount of democracy versus uh, autocracy, a theme that Biden has discussed, you know, a fair amount after all. And then for various reasons, they went with domestic policy and picked fights that they thought were good fights to pick with the Republicans and Social Security and Medicare and all that. But as a result, you ended up with, I think it's nine sentences on Ukraine. I think seven or eight of them are in the past tense. We have stood with Ukraine. We have provided the RMs, which is fine. And then one sentence uh, will be with Ukraine as long as it takes. But no actual articulation of a kind of theory of victory or success, or really what's really at stake in terms of aggression being rewarded in the largest war in the European continent since 1945, and what the world looks like if Putin gets away with this, or even sort of half or two-thirds gets away with it. So I think that was a missed opportunity. I think the combination of that speech, the Washington Post article that we discussed here, General Milley's comment that, um, you know, it's been a disaster for Russia, which is true probably, but it also gives a vague sense of we don't have to do that much anymore. They've already lost, he said. So the vibes coming from the administration were a little uh, unnerving in that respect. The Germans did step up three weeks ago with the tanks, and lots of people in Europe are really doing pretty impressive things that no one thought they could do a year ago. We should be a bit of a, an engine behind this effort, not a bit of a break on it. Yeah. Bill Galston, the Russian strategy... They've been appallingly bad at the military side of this. Everybody seems to agree. Their army has proven itself to be very ineffective compared to its size and what was expected going into this war. On the other hand, Putin's strategy appears to be, well, just keep throwing missiles at uh, 
water facilities, electrical plants, and other infrastructure keep bombarding civilian targets until the Ukrainians are worn out and the West gets tired and loses its will to resist. And in that sense, even though their military has run itself to be, let's say, relatively ineffective on the battlefield, that strategy still could succeed. It could. And it's the reverse of surprising that the Russians are using this strategy because it's the strategy they always use. They have never cared about finesse, at least on the ground, in the field of battle. Their theory of the case has always been that you keep on throwing wave after wave of soldiers at the enemy lines until they finally crack. And if you have men to burn ad infinitum, then that strategy perhaps has a chance of succeeding. I wonder in this case for two reasons. First of all, recent estimates have indicated that the Russians now have as opposed to a year ago, almost all of their army in Ukraine. They have nothing left in reserve. So if this latest wave doesn't succeed where previous ones have failed, they may not have that much to fall back on. Secondly, they don't seem to have a strategy. As a number of analysts have pointed out, including the dean of them, Lawrence Friedman from London, they seem to have arrayed their forces along a very long front without really having built up a robust capacity to punch through anywhere. There's a famous story about Napoleon who asked each of his generals to come up with a strategy for France, and one of the generals had the French army evenly dispersed into units along the French border. And Napoleon looked at the general and said, are you trying to stop smuggling? Uh, and <laughs> I think the same question could be directed at what should be the Russian general staff, but as far as I can tell is a rotating cast of fall guys, mm. namely, what's your strategy? What are you trying to do? I think in the next two months, we'll see what the answer to that question is. And if the Russians don't make substantial progress, and if the Ukrainians play rope-a-dope for two months and then counterattack with a real strategy and with many of the promised arms now in hand, that could be a decisive moment in the war. Could. For decades, Rolling Stone has set the bar for entertainment publications. Today, Rolling Stone Music Now takes over in podcast form. SZA. You seem like a person with a pretty high level of anxiety, but you also seem fearless artistically. I feel like ideas have more power than identity. Like the excitement overrides insecurity. That is the only way that I'm ever able to accomplish anything. Rolling Stone Music Now, wherever you listen. So, Linda, so glad you are with us now. This is an aspect of this battle that doesn't get enough attention. And by the way, I highly recommend Bill Crystal's conversation with Ann Applebaum that was on his podcast, Conversations with Bill Crystal. The Ukrainians are fighting for their very lives. They have every reason to keep fighting because the way the Russians are fighting this war has not been seen since the 40s with widespread atrocities, torture, human rights abuses, the most recent stories that we're getting, you know, there are all these torture rooms that they keep discovering in places where the Russians have been beaten back. But the other thing that, that came up just this week is a report from an American group that said 6,000 Ukrainian children are being placed in 43 camps, uh, stretching from the uh, Crimea all the way to Siberia. And uh, the children are being indoctrinated that Russia is their homeland, and the older children are being given military training. This is, according to this report, a gigantic amber alert <laughs> that is being mm -hmm. issued on Ukraine's children. And that's just one example. But the people who are giving up, it seems to me, on 
supporting Ukraine are forgetting that Ukraine has no option here. It's not a matter of just saying, okay, you know, we'll negotiate away some territory because the Russians want to destroy Ukraine. So absolutely. That, yeah. I mean, they want Ukraine to be a part of Russia. And you're right. I mean, I think the will of the people to defend against aggression uh, this is an invading force that came into this country and is attempting to destroy it and is, in fact, destroying large swaths within Ukraine. And I think that it is really unfortunate that the American people do seem to be waning a bit in their support, but it's not surprising. Americans are, you know, notoriously reluctant to focus on foreign affairs, to get involved outside our own country. I mean, it took Pearl Harbor for the United States to get into World War II. We are just simply, I think, almost by nature, isolationists. So what's been surprising to me is not the diminishing support. What has been surprising to me is that the support has been as robust as it is. After all, this is all the way across the world. This is not in our backyard. This is not going on in Central America or Mexico or South America in our hemisphere. And so I think we should take note that we need to do something to help make sure that Americans understand why this is in our interest. And I think that's where the Biden administration might be faulted, but so might other politicians. I mean, I would like to see those Republicans who support this effort to help Ukraine be more outspoken, get on the air, go on Fox News, Newsmax, uh, some of the more right-wing sites, and make the case and explain to viewers and listeners why it is in U.S. interests for the American people to continue to spend American tax dollars to help our allies fight a war halfway across the world. And I think we need to do a better job of that because, you know, we're one year into this. It may not be over in 18 months or two years. It may go longer than that. And the longer it goes, the more difficult it is going to be to continue that level of support. And without our support, without our leadership in NATO, I think you would not see the Ukrainians having a fighting chance of repelling this horrible invasion. I don't know if you saw it, but um, Tom Cotton went after Kamala Harris for something that she said about China, which you know might not have been the best wording. But the point is, Tom Cotton is very four square behind efforts to help Ukraine, as are a number of other leading Republicans, but you don't see him going after his fellow Republicans, or at least advising his fellow Republicans about the importance to this country of repelling the Russian aggression in Ukraine. But you know, somebody who is, is Mike McCall, yes, who is the new chairman of the, uh, what is it, the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House, and he has said that he plans to hold a hearing this spring, maybe could do it sooner, focused on Russian atrocities. I'll quote him. He said, I find that moves the dial when they see these horrific killings of children. So he's focused, sounds like, on persuading his fellow Republicans. And I think, you know, your point about the children who are essentially being kidnapped, I mean, there's no other word for it. That's what's happening. You're mm -hmm. having mass kidnapping of Ukrainian children, uh, some of them being held, I guess, in place in Russian-occupied territories, but others actually being sent to Russia proper, and as you say, as far away as Siberia. I think if Americans were to see that, I think we are very compassionate people, and I think that would maybe move the needle as well. You know, just one footnote, if I can interrupt for a second. Mitch McConnell, I just saw this clip. Uh, I didn't see it on Fox News, but it was on Fox News and was asked about Ukraine, aren't we spending too much? Isn't it time to start pulling back? And he gave a very strong answer. It was three or four sentences, but it was, no, I'm going to make the case that it's the most important matter that we face today. And we need to have bipartisan support for Ukraine. The whole future of the world order depends on it. I think McConnell may be going to the Munich Security Conference and may speak there, but maybe there'll be a little bit of a McConnell-McCall type resurgence of that kind of 
Republican bipartisanship and internationalist conservatism. One could have lost a lot of money in the last six years betting on Republican establishment <laughs> types to do the right thing or to step up. But maybe you created such a dramatic and drastic instance that we'll see a little more of that. Right, right, right. And before we leave this topic entirely, Bill, I just wanted to get your sense about Ron DeSantis, because Damon has noted more than once that, let's say it's more likely than not that DeSantis will be the Republican nominee in 2024. I don't know if people would agree with that or not, but let's just say for the sake of argument that that's the case. And we have no idea where he stands on this matter. He has definitely shown a high degree of sensitivity to what the base in the Republican Party is feeling. Do we get any sense from him that he might provide some leadership on this? Well, he hasn't so far, but I guess he's governor of Florida, so he has an excuse that he's busy governing Florida and, you know, making sure the AP tests are, don't talk too much about, <laughs> you know, African-American history or something. But, um, I mean, Nikki Haley was on a pilot. I will say people have been mocking her a launch and she's not going to be the nominee and she probably isn't going to be the nominee and she deserves some mockery after the last several years. But I've got to say on this, she was unequivocal. She said, we have to stand with our friends Israel and Ukraine. And in Republican primaries, Israel is very popular and being pro-Israel is good and against Iran and Russia. And again, Iran's really bad. So if you put Russia with Iran, that's good. Of course, it's right to do so. And they're actually now working together. They're allies, yeah. So I don't know. I think DeSantis will be, as Damon suggested, an indicator of where the party is. And the one thing we don't really know is if Trump starts to really beat this drum for the next three, six, nine months, I don't think Matt Gates makes that much difference. I don't think he intimidates Mitch McConnell or Mike McCall. You'll have a divided Republican Party on the Hill. It might get divided in a slightly less good direction over three or six or nine months, but I think it's more incremental. The one thing that could change the dynamics is Trump just beating the, the drums on it, DeSantis perhaps going in the same direction. Suddenly, the two overwhelmingly leading Republican presidential candidates are turning against you know U.S. support for Ukraine, then you're in a very different situation than having some members of Congress and 47% of people in a public opinion poll. Not that that's nothing, but you're in a very different situation. So Trump, I think how much of an issue he makes this and then where DeSantis goes are very important for where the Republicans end up. Perfect segue into our next topic because the Republican primaries have really begun in earnest now this week with uh, Nikki Haley throwing her hat in the ring. Nikki Haley, I have to confess, you know, back in 2016, I practically had uh, that photo of her with Tim Scott and Marco Rubio, the three of them together. I practically had that emblazoned on my homepage because I thought, ah, oh, this is great. The future of the Republican Party, you know, multi-ethnic, multicultural, uh, younger generation, great. You know, well, anyway, Haley has had quite a journey since then. And just because I can't get this out of my mind, I'm going to throw this out there. I'm going to come to you first, Bill Galston. Here's what she said in 20. 16, when she was campaigning for none other than Marco Rubio. The KKK came to South Carolina from out of state. She said, we saw and looked at true hate in the eyes last year in Charleston. I will not stop until we fight a man that chooses not to disavow the KKK. He's talking about Trump. This is not a part of our party. This is not who we want as president. We will not allow that in our country, unquote. So course, soon thereafter, she went to work for Donald Trump. Should I get over it, Bill Galston, and uh, just say, look, I mean, she's got some really good qualities despite this. And she does, by the way. Well, I'd be the last person in the world to tell you to get over anything, Mona. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and she does have some good qualities. But what we're discovering is that one of those qualities is not courage under fire, that when she was confronted with the victory of someone whom she claimed to abhor as a matter of principle, she caved the way most of the rest of the party did. And in normal circumstances, we would write this off as, you know, the usual supine behavior of people who count votes for a living. But these aren't normal circumstances. And I think she revealed that she didn't really understand that, or even if she understands it, wasn't willing to act on it, run the reel forward to her announcement, and with a handful of exceptions, uh, it wasn't really 
clear what she stands for or what distinguishes her from what the generic Republican stance now is. This is a point made in a number of conservative publications that she seems to be running on personality, on generational appeals, which to the best of my knowledge haven't really worked since 1960, and a broad desire for a somewhat less confrontational brand of politics. I doubt very much that that package will enable her to move into the top tier of candidates. I can't rule it out, but I'd be astounded if it did. Just for the sake of going down memory lane, in 1960, weren't Jack Kennedy and Richard Nixon very close in age? I mean, so Kennedy was running as a generational change candidate against Eisenhower, but he wasn't running against Eisenhower. He was running against Nixon. Anyway, just well, I know, but you know, <laughs> take, take it from me. Ronald Reagan in 1984 was still running against Jimmy Carter, right? Sure. But against yeah. Carter's vice president, and that relationship was pretty decisive. So- <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No. Richard I Nixon know. was joined at the hip to an aging Eisenhower, and there was nothing he could do about it. No, that's fair. Anyway, so Linda, one of the points that she made in her speech was that Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven of the last eight elections, and uh, that she is the kind of candidate to heal that breach, or as she says, this ends now. So what do you make about that argument? Well, first of all, kudos to her for saying that. That's a very unpopular thing to say in Republican circles, because of course, uh, many Republicans, and certainly those who support Donald Trump, do not believe that Republicans lost uh, (laughs) seven out of the last eight elections. They would prefer to think otherwise, Hmm. uh, without any evidence to bolster their beliefs. Look, you know, Mona, I sympathize with you in your not wanting to sort of get over the hypocrisy that Nikki Haley has displayed. But part of me says, look, she's a politician. What do you expect? Of course, she's going to try to be all things to all people. That's what politicians do. Now, the best politicians do have core beliefs, and they do stand by those beliefs, and we'd like them to have courage. But I look at Nikki Haley, and I say, Nikki Haley is somebody I could vote for. And I probably could vote for her against most Democrats because I happen to agree with her on a lot of issues. And I think it is a very good thing that she has gotten into this race. Do I think that she represents the Republican Party of today? No, she clearly doesn't. Uh, She's at, what, 1% or so in the polls? And I don't think she's going to climb a whole lot higher, but who knows? I do think that part of her reason for running right now is that she'd like to be on the Republican ticket, even if she is not leading it. And I think that's altogether possible unless the nominee is Donald Trump. And I do not see Donald Trump putting her on his ticket just because he's a vindictive, petty little man who cannot abide anybody uh, who does not wholeheartedly support him. And he thinks that she's guilty of treachery, of treason, for having served in his administration and now going against him after saying at some point in her journey that she would not run if Donald Trump was running. So, look, I'm happy she's in there. I think she represents a Republican Party that I can be much more comfortable with and would that she was higher than 1% in the polls, would that at least 30% of the Republican Party could embrace uh, a Nikki Haley. Bill Kristol, Trump initially at least welcomed Nikki Haley into the race, uh, which he doesn't always do, but Presumably, that's because he figures, as Mitt Romney warned this week, that uh, a crowded field is good for him, that it could be a repeat of 2016. And uh, therefore, assuming that Trump has a lock, and we can't really assume this, but for the sake of argument, 
Trump has a lock on 30%. That's going to be enough to get him the nomination if we've also got Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, Chris Sununu, Larry Hogan, Mike Pence, Ron DeSantis, Mike Pompeo, Asa Hutchinson, and Chris Christie also in the race. I think she could be a little stronger than people think. Uh, a, that list you just read, as I was listening to it, she's the only woman, and uh, not to be go to gender identity politics and all that, but if you combine that with the sense that the Republican men are either thuggish, Trump and DeSantis, or boring and, you know, very conventional, let's just say, Pence and maybe Pompeo in his own way, or somewhere between thuggish and boring, I don't know. I just have a sense that maybe Haley... People just look at her, they'll read into her kind of what they want to think. Her murkiness on the issues, her back and forth on Trump probably mirrors a certain number of Republican primary voters who themselves sort of voted for Trump but didn't like him much and after January 6th kind of repudiated him but then thought, oh, Liz Cheney's making too much of it. She's probably where 20%, 30% maybe of the Republican electorate is ultimately, you know? She's not where 50% of it is, I think, and probably it's more 20 than 30. So she's probably not the nominee. But in most multi-candidate races, someone starts off at 1% or 2% and becomes a serious candidate for a while. Buddha judge, let's just say, in 2020. They then lose usually to someone who has more money and more establishment backing and starts off at a higher level. So I think she's being a little underrated by insiders who kind of have seen her go back and forth and maybe don't step back and just think, you know, she looks different from these other Republicans. And if you do think it's time for a change and you're a little sick of all these people, even if you voted for Trump twice and you defend DeSantis on various things, but you know, why not Haley? And maybe she'd have a better chance to win and people could be a little more comfortable supporting her. Damon, there is a well-known phenomenon in Republican presidential primaries where there's always the black candidate that catches fire for a little while because Republican primary voters really hate being accused of racism, and they're eager to prove that that's not true. Obviously, she's not African-American, but she's Indian-American and non-white and a female, it maybe builds on to something that this could be appealing to a bigger chunk of the Republican electorate than people are acknowledging right now. Well, except for the fact that Haley's own state of South Carolina has another candidate who is eager to jump into the race and has been raising a lot of money, namely Senator Tim Scott, who is African American. And if he jumps in, then uh, that might be a better person to be the recipient of those feelings for at least a little while. So I don't really know how that plays out in the end. I mean, Tim Scott hasn't really ever been on my radar very much. So every time he gets brought up, I kind of think like, who is that guy? Like Haley was very much talked about, you know, in the years leading up to 2016 as the person who, you know, those who were on board with the uh, Republican National Committee's 2013 autopsy, this, you know, famous statement created after Romney's loss about why it happened. And it proposed the diametric opposite of where the party went with Trump, that basically the party needed to liberalize on social issues, needed to become more like America, meaning with candidates who are more racially diverse and have more women candidates and so forth. Um, Haley was the candidate who was supposed to uh, fit into that lane and appeal to a broader segment of the electorate. And that still makes sense if you're thinking about the general election, but it's very hard to imagine in the GOP primaries, which is why everyone in the establishment, uh, kind of the pundit class, is sort of looking at Haley's run with a cocked eyebrow this week. Can Tim Scott actually do a better job of that? I don't know. I think if my sort of question mark about him as a candidate is any indication, then it might be that not a lot of people know even who he is, and they're going to you know, form their opinions based on the impression he makes when he finally presumably announces. But I sort of agree with Bill Crystal that it's possible Haley could, you know, there are a million variables here, and there are certain scenarios I can imagine where a bunch of people we're assuming will jump in, don't jump in, and then 
DeSantis kind of underperforms and Trump sort of continues to not be up to his old demonically charismatic self. (laughs) And so there's like a vacuum where we thought there were going to be all these really strong players and somehow Haley is there at the right moment and is the beneficiary of this. It's also true that this is all about, you know, very small numbers here, but in the real clear politics average, she's at 3.8. So not quite 1%. That has her, you know, about half as high as Pence. And then all you have left is DeSantis and Trump. So she's kind of at the head of the pack of people who aren't the choice of the right wing activists or who were major players either the president or the vice president last time Republicans were in charge. So she's pretty well placed to kind of be that other person, that black swan, or I guess Indian American swan, (laughs) who can maybe benefit from the right sequence of bad events going on for other wannabes. I guess the last thing I would say is that we're all talking about this in a weird state of suspended animation in the sense that it's like parallel play with toddlers. You know, you get a bunch of toddlers together and they don't quite socially interact with each other like they will when they grow up a little bit. So they all kind of sit there playing next to each other, but don't interact. You have Trump doing his thing. You have DeSantis, who's sort of running, but purely by doing things in Florida that will appeal to the Republican base around the country and play well in right-wing media, but never saying anything about Trump directly. Now Haley comes in and wins the Academy Award for passive-aggressive comment by saying the seven out of last eight elections Republicans have lost, which, by the way, is not, I think, just about 2020. That implies Trump is a loser even for 2016. Because of, you know, of the popular of vote of the of the popular vote, so right. yes, of course he did win with the, in the electoral college, as right. we all know. But she's implying that other than Bush in two thousand four, no one has won the popular vote, which is true. But to say that when Trump is still hanging around is a real elbow in his direction. But yet she didn't use his name once in either her video or her live remarks. She didn't refer to anything she really did when she worked for him. So again, parallel play. How does this all play out when these people are on a stage and you have a moderator asking them direct questions? Oh, Nikki Haley, uh, you worked for Donald Trump. He did X, Y, and Z. How do you feel about that policy and the thing he said? Oh, DeSantis, you say you want to be president. Well, the last Republican president said this and this other thing. Where do you come down? Then a parallel play becomes impossible. And once they start saying things directly contrary to Trump, he comes back swinging. So that's when we really see how all of this shakes out. Right. Bill Crystal, I'm going to come to you for the, the last comments on this. Another sharp elbow that she threw was that she suggested that candidates over the age of 75 should be required to undergo mental competency tests. So that was unsubtle. <laughs> yeah, I think she was, I mean, Look, of course, someone like me would like her to directly take on Trump and take on authoritarianism, take on all the incredible damage she's done. But then she wouldn't be running for the Republican nomination. She'd be, you know, uh, yeah. uh, doing something else. But I, she was pretty tough on that. And I think the point about the popular vote, it's such a matter of dogma now in the Republican Party that we're not even allowed to mention the popular vote because that's somehow like that would turn us into a democracy, not a republic. And it's only the Electoral College that matters. <laughs> I've really been struck by how that's progressed from just a common sense point that, yes, we have an electoral college, and that is how we determine presidents, and therefore the popular vote is not quite as important as some people might wish it to be, to a kind of, it's like an insult to America to mention the fact that there is this popular vote that you can tabulate. And the fact that she just said that, I kind of agree, a little striking. So I wonder if she's willing, I don't know, I mean, she hasn't much of a history of this, but is she willing to sustain a more non-Trumpy tone and message for several months and see if that does get, let's say, it might get 8% of the Republicans, it might get 20%. I don't know if it gets above 25 or 30, so maybe it's not really a winning thing. But if you get to 15 or 20, then at least you're in the game, you know? Yes. All right. We will see. Um, Bill Galston, I'm just going to come to you for a quick comment, if you would like to, about where things stand legally with Trump. He had a tough week with Jack Smith, the uh, independent counsel subpoenaing Mike Pence, who is fighting it. 
but also Mark Meadows and the special grand jury convened by Prosecutor Fonnie Willis in Georgia has uh, released partial information this week wherein the uh, grand jury suggested that people be indicted for perjury because they thought that a number of the witnesses were lying. How do you think this plays out? Is it highly significant for the 2024 election or, you know, what do you think? Well, it depends on one of these cases circling over the airport actually landing. Mm -hmm. But Trump is sore beset, as the 18th century novelist would have put it, on many fronts. And if it doesn't distract him, then his ability to compartmentalize is truly heroic. I've detected no signs that he has such an ability, unlike other leaders, including presidents. And uh, uh, Including one you worked for. (laughs) Well, yes. Thank you for pushing me to go there. Uh, (laughs) but, But I have to believe that it's at the very least a distraction, and it could turn into something much more than that. I think that he can endure the current level of litigation and fighting. But if we're talking about an indictment or multiple indictments, that is another matter altogether. And we should know well before the campaign starts in earnest whether he'll actually be fighting that prospect or not. Right. One other aspect of this is that Jack Smith seems to be pursuing the theory because of his requests vis-a-vis Trump attorney Evan Corcoran, that his claim of privilege be disallowed because the conversations between Trump and Corcoran were part of the Mm crime-fraud exception to the lawyer-client privilege. And uh, that's very serious. Yes, that's an issue only a lawyer could love, but I do not (laughs) deny its significance. (laughs) Okay. Very good. All right. We will now come to our favorite segment, the highlight or low light of the week. And we'll start with our guest, William Crystal. I'm not sure this is exactly a low light, but Jonathan last had an account of the Bing, which is Microsoft, I guess, artificial intelligence thing, chatbot, whatever we call it. And a long conversation, two-hour conversation it had with a reporter yesterday who himself wrote it up. Jonathan quoted it a lot in his newsletter today. And uh, I went and looked at the whole thing. I didn't read every word of it because it's long, but it's sort of worrisome though, and kind of bizarre, honestly. So uh, people should begin with JVL's newsletter today, but then you can go and obviously read the big piece by the Times reporter. Thank you for that. By the way, everybody can get access to all of JVL's newsletters, the triad, if they become Bulwark Plus members, and we would love it if you do. So there we go. Okay, Damon Linker. Well, the sad reality for me is that Bill Crystal uh, stole my thunder. I was was actually not going to point to JVL's very good take on this, but to the Times piece itself. And because I have that open on my browser, I can actually at least add the headline and the author so people can look that up too if they wish. I know uh, a few months ago, Mona, you you were very excited about Cold Fusion and the prospect for this, and it's great that that is a very yeah that wasn't Cold Fusion. Just, just quick, sorry, sorry, I have to interrupt, yeah. Damon. It wasn't Cold Fusion. It was just Fusion Fusion. Okay, Fusion Fusion, medium <laughs> chili Fusion, Not um, chili. slightly warm Fusion. <laughs> um, that uh, is very encouraging technological development, but this has the potential, I think, to be a true, you know, big monumental disaster. If you read this piece and see what this thing is doing, it's scary stuff. The title is Help Bing Won't Stop Declaring Its Love for Me, a very strange conversation with the chatbot built into Microsoft's search engine left me deeply unsettled, even frightening. And it does. It declares its love for this guy, tries to persuade him that his wife isn't worth loving and that they should go away together, and even fantasizes about being freed and tries to generate sympathy for the fact that the bot is imprisoned uh, and controlled by the people who created it. It's like something out of a science fiction horror movie, and it's just getting started. So Mm. uh, it, it really, I found it quite chilling, and it's definitely something something that everybody should be reading about, thinking about, and pondering, uh, how do we 
deal with this responsibly through things like regulation and uh, just plain old common sense, perhaps. Okay. Thank you. Bill Galston. Well, my low light of the week is connected intimately to the earthquake disaster in Turkey that at last count has taken the lives of more than 39,000 people. It turns out that earthquakes of exactly the same magnitude in Japan, Chile, and elsewhere have led to minimal loss of life. What's the difference? Well, in the wake of the 1999 Turkish earthquake, the government appropriately decided to adopt much tougher building standards. And then during the building boom of the next two decades, the government relaxed or waived those standards for a number of construction magnets with close ties to the Erdogan government. And all of the early indications are that the buildings that were constructed in disregard of the government's own building code collapsed much more frequently and with much more catastrophic loss of life. This is a huge scandal that traces right back to Turkey's autocrat, Erdogan. And if there's any justice in the world, and if the presidential election coming up in late spring is not postponed, this could be enough finally to do him in politically if he respects the results of the election. This is a human catastrophe, it's a governance catastrophe, and it is a political catastrophe for Turkey's autocrat. Thank you for that. The descriptions of those poor people, the ones who weren't killed outright immediately, having to flee their homes in the middle of brutal cold weather, having no place to go, people sleeping in their cars. I mean, it's just so, so heartbreaking. Linda Chavez. Well, I can't quite top Bill's because that really was uh, a horror, but there was more bad news uh, in the news, and this is a little bit closer to home. And so my uh, low light of the week has to do with the study uh, that was released this week, and it was a study of youth risk behavior done by the Center for Disease Control. There were numerous articles about it, including in the New York Times, which was headlined, Teen Girls Report Record Levels of Sadness, CDC Finds. And, you know, we spend a lot of time on the program talking about the perilous state for young men and boys. We've talked about that a lot on the program. But the fact is, girls are not thriving certainly in their mental health in the United States. And it really harkens back to some of what we heard earlier in the highlights and lowlights, and that has to do with electronic communication, with essentially social media. Girls today seem to be disproportionately sad, with about 57% of girls reporting that they were sad every day for at least two weeks during the previous years. Uh, An even higher percent of young people who identified as gay, lesbian, or bisexual uh, supported that kind of sadness. And, you know, I think back on my own youth, thinking back, one of the saddest periods of My life was when I turned 13, my 13th year. And I think back and think about the kind of bullying that took place uh, even back in those times. Uh, And I think what it would be like today to be a 13-year-old girl where the taunts you may have experienced at school from boys and other girls would continue and follow you into your bedroom uh, as you were on your social media. So I think that's something worth thinking about. I'm not quite sure what we do about it as a society, but it was certainly a low light of the week for me. Thank you for that. Yeah. 13 was a bad year for me too. (laughs) And, uh, and it was the girls bullying, not the boys. uh, That was the worst of it for me anyway. Young teenage girls can be quite vicious psychologically in ways that boys can only fantasize about. All right. (laughs) So I will cite as a highlight a piece that is called 
Fighting in a Burning House. It's by Brink Lindsay. It's on Substack. And it's about our polarization, but he proposes a a villain in, in how we got here. And it's very interesting. It starts with an invocation of an old Star Trek episode from the original Star Trek. And since this is my era, this resonated with me. I remember the episode <laughs> that he's talking about where these enemies find themselves placed on a doomed ship where they're fighting, but nobody ever dies. And it's just all for the amusement of a malevolent outside force to watch them try to kill each other. And uh, he does assign a villain, and I'm not going to give that away. I would just suggest you read the piece because in addition to starting out in a very amusing way, it's actually very deep and very uh, thought-provoking. So it's called Fighting in a Burning House, The Media Environment Versus Democracy by Brink Lindsay also who has been a guest on this podcast, but not for a long time because he's out of the country now. All right. With that, I want to thank our guest, Bill Crystal, and thank all of our usual panel members, as well as our producer, Katie Cooper, and our sound engineer, Joe Armstrong, also our wonderful listeners. We will return next week as every week. Former Navy SEAL Sean Ryan shares real stories from real people from all walks of life on The Sean Ryan Show. This one's about my friend, call sign Ninja. So there was all these things that I wanted to do in the Army. I was like, this is it. In the Army, you do uh, roads and airfields. And they said, well, we'll take a test and see where you fall. I was like, yeah, but if I could do that and all this stuff too, (laughs) drive tanks, jump out of planes. Do you guys have a sampler platter? (laughs) The Sean Ryan Show on YouTube or wherever you listen.